Good evening. My name is Dr. Pajit Manapha, a second year student at the Faculty of Commerce and Accountancy, Jalalabad University, and a member of the HCAP Academics Committee. On behalf of Harvard's College in Asia program, Jalalabad University, it is with my pleasure to welcome everyone to our 2016 Harvard HCAP conference. I am delighted to have you here to participate and share in our conference under the theme Equality, Tolerance, and Freedom The Effect of Culture and Policy in a Globalized World. Thank you all for coming. HCAP is a student run organization that promotes intellectual and cultural exchange between Harvard University students and partner university students around the world. Through immersion in our host institution activities and interaction with Harvard students, we strive to put a great emphasis on global issues, allowing delegates to develop a more sophisticated understanding of the international and local communities, as well as to build cooperative and dynamic relationships between the future leaders of the United States and Thailand. Earlier this January, eight HCAP Bangkok members, along with other HCAP partner universities from Dubai, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, Istanbul, Seoul, and Mumbai, traveled to Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts to participate in a similar conference held by Harvard students. And now, it is our honor to welcome 12 Harvard students who are sitting right here today in Bangkok. I hope all of you have had a wonderful time. In today's connected and digitalized world, our current generation has more ways and opportunities to bring about change than ever in our history. Never before has our collective online voice been so powerful, where dialogues on social networks have forced governments and businesses around the world to be accountable for their actions. Every single person now plays a crucial role in pushing forth the issues that matter into the spotlight of policymakers and politicians. Online privacy, wealth inequalities, LGBT rights, modern day slavery, sexual and reproductive rights, the list goes on. Over the past week, our HCAP conference sessions have touched upon several of these cross-cultural issues. It is only appropriate to conclude the conference with a holistic summary of the current situation and look ahead to the future challenges that awaits. No one is able to shed light upon these issues in a more profound and engaging way than His Excellency Dr. Surin Pitsuan, former Secretary General of ASEAN, a native of Nahanti Amarat, seasoned diplomat and articulate speaker, Dr. Sarin earned a BA in political science from Claremont McKenna College and furthered his education at Harvard University, where he received his MA and PhD in the field of political science and Middle Eastern studies. Dr. Sarin has been active in politics as a member of parliament and deputy leader of the Democrat Party and has taken roles such as the Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1997 to 2001. During his tenure as the Secretary General of ASEAN from 2008 to 2012, Dr. Sarin prepared the region to enter into the ASEAN community. Dr. Sarin's experience in foreign policy and deep understanding of the social dimension of globalization will allow us to grasp the significance of cultural understanding in a globalized world, further supplemented by anecdotes from his distinguished academic and political career. There will also be a Q&A session following the keynote. Without further ado, I am pleased to welcome His Excellency, Dr. Sarin Pitsuwan, former Secretary General of ASEAN. Thank you very much, boss. This afternoon. This is my third engagement today. In the morning, it was a TV interview uh, for a channel here in, in Bangkok. And then in the afternoon, I had to go to speak to the Waterwork, Metropolitan Waterworks Authority, who is in charge of clean water for the metropolitan area of Bangkok. President Kennedy is 
son of Harvard once said when he was receiving his honorary degree from Yale. He said, I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. Meaning his education at Harvard was recognized by the great university of Yale. Today I feel like I have the best of the three worlds. You see, I did not go to the love of God University. I went to the rival one, Thomasan University. <laughs> So, coming from Thomasad, with Thomasad education, speaking at Tula University with the presence of Harvard students, this is the best of all three worlds. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. But, I think your generation is now going to inherit the world. Very, very fractured. Very, very and you will have to shepherd this world into the future with all the problems, all the challenges that my generation, the last generation, have been putting upon this little island called Earth. The new post 2015 agenda at the UN reflects the reality that all 7 billion, 7.3 billion humanity on this little planet will have to learn to take care of this little village of ours. By the year 2050, we will have about 2 billion more human beings. So we will have 9.5 billion on this, what is described as, what is it, flat and hot and crowded, little planet. We have to be prepared for that flat, meaning no borders, meaning we are all connected, meaning Anything that happens anywhere in the world will have its implication and consequence on our life everywhere. Hot because of the global warming. Crowded because of the number of people being born into Earth. More will be living longer because of the technology, because of the medical technology, because of the medical technology at the Babies survive more, old people will survive longer. So, the responsibility and the burden is for this generation. Are you prepared to inherit that world, which is very, very fractionalized, very divided, and very competitive, and very diverse? Cultures developed because we all have to adjust to our own environments. You live in the desert, you evolve your own culture for survival. So the laws and the cultures and the norms in the desert society are extremely harsh, exact, no compromise. Why? Because to survive, you have to be very, very strong. Belonging to your tribe, devoted to your tribe, survive together with your tribe. If you don't give your all to your tribe, the tribe can be extinct because of the rivalry among various tribes in a very, very harsh environment. Those of us who are here in the tropical area, we evolve our cultures 
different. We are very relaxed, we are very friendly to each other, and we are flexible, and we are accommodating, and we are rather compromising. We smile a lot. Because we accommodate each other. People in the West, people in Latin America, people in Africa, various countries, various tribes, involve their own culture. In the past, we did not have much opportunity to interact with each other. Only after the Industrial Revolution, only after the colonial period, when the world became connected and the world became much, much smaller. With the IT technology now, it is a village. Instant communication connects us with everyone else. The challenge is how to live in this world of diversity, world of differences, world of various cosmologies, various norms, various value systems. During the time of the ideological conflict, when the world was in before the end of history, you remember that book? When the world was divided into two camps, the free world and the communist and the socialist world, or the socialist world, two polars, taking care of each other, confronting where they be, where they met, but essentially in control of the situation in their own camp. It was called the Cold War. There were a lot of small wars under these two camps. But now, the camps are gone, disappeared, ideological conflict somehow disappeared. We are now connected. The world has become very multipolar, but there is no pluralistic system to sustain that multipolar world. That's why the UN is in trouble. What happened? Better? Oh, I should sing. <laughs> so, so, the world that we are seeing now is the world of tremendous diversity. The world that is full of conflicts over many issues, natural resources. It has been predicted that the next cause of the global, of the world war, will be the fight over fresh water. Because there's no fresh water enough to feed our agriculture, to feed our people, to feed our livestock. So there are a lot of tension over fighting over natural resources. And when we have reason to confront and to face each other and to be in conflict with each other, what do we do? We muster our cultural identity or identities, our values, our norms, our cosmology, our perception of our own identity, our own in our history. We have survived up to this point because of all these great things that we have in our culture, that we have in our civilizations. We have the answer for our present and for our future. You on the other camp are wrong. We will take care of ours, and you will take care of yours, and there will be a lot of opportunity, uh, flashpoints between us and among us. That is what is happening around the world now. And one of the Harvard scholars, Mr. Huntington, said, there shall be the clash of civilizations in the global community. A lot of people laugh at him. But I think what you are seeing now is the
the world is trying to adjust to the diversity that we have to accommodate, that we have to appreciate, that we have to learn to respect, that we have to learn to share with each other. Otherwise, we are not going to survive as a species. Mr. Wilson at the Department of Sociology and Biology at Harvard. There's a building called William James Building, right? Anybody of you from sociology or from anthropology? Fantastic. So Mr. Mr. Wilson had this theory called sociobiology. Yeah? Have you heard of it? He just wrote a piece, a very, very good piece in, I believe, in, uh, in the Financial Times this week. He said, these insects, ants, live in colony. And they want to make sure that their genes survive into the future. And what they do is they take care of each other as a community. They do the division of labor among themselves. They would go out and get you know, honey and come and feed those who are in the beehives. And there's a queen inside. They want to make sure that they survive as a species, as a colony, as a set of genes. He said human beings may have to evolve to that evolution or evolutionary stage. Which means we have to be conscious of the fact that we belong to one species. We may be different in colors, we may be different in size, we may be different in, yes, cultures, norms, value system, but we are all Homo sapiens. In the past, in the past, all living organisms were wiped out once from the surface of the earth. When was that? 65 million years ago. When we were told, we are told that a big near meteorites hit the earth, there was this cloud of dust covering the atmosphere. All living organisms died, perished, including the dinosaurs. We were not here yet. We came later. Our evolutionary process began much later. So the point we have to understand is, 65 years ago, this planet Earth lost all its living mechanisms, but there was no moral or ethical dimension to that catastrophe because it was purely a natural phenomenon. The risk is, from now onward, we, 7.3 billion of us, human beings, are becoming the cause, the contributor, and the author of our own catastrophe into the future. Because each and every one of us are emitting heat into the atmosphere. We are responsible, responsible for this, uh, what do you call this, glass house phenomenon. The ice in the North Pole is melting. The rivers are drying up. Weather pattern change. And there is a scientific proof. There is, there has been a scientific proof. What Mr. Al Gore called the inconvenient truth. We are the authors of our own possible extinction. So, what are we going to do? If we know that there is that possibility, if we know that there is, there is that potentiality, what are we going to do with it now? That's why one of your souvenirs quoted 
Mr. Kati, saying, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Gandhi said, you need to be part of that change. But he said that during his struggle for independence from the UK. Now, the world has a different perspective of this world that he's talking about. Because the world has that opportunity to see our planet from far away in distant space, that blue little dots is our home. And science is telling us that there is going to be one point, if we are not careful, that that little dot is going to turn from blue to brown. That that little home of yours is going to be hot and inhabitable. This mindset will have to be infused into every human mind, child or adult, east or west, developed or underdeveloped or developing world. 7.3 billion of us will have to adopt this mindset, which says, I would call it the global consciousness. I would call it the global awareness. Because we need to adopt that perspective that there is a point in the distant future, not very distant, that we could, as a species, as a planet, will drive ourselves into extinction. Maybe this is what the theory of evolution in the past several years, if you observe carefully, Darwin at Cambridge said, all living organisms evolve into more sophisticated, more complex organisms, human beings included. And he said, those who will survive will have to adjust to the environment and will have to adopt a way of life that would guarantee the survival. He called it the survival of the fittest. Henri Bergson across the British Channel in Paris came up with something a little bit beyond what Darwin had to say. Survival of the fittest physical. Henri Bergson said no. It has to be not just physical survival, it will have to be spiritual survival. It will have to be the awareness of the mind that together we have to find a path forward for our own survival of our own species. Hungry works on song in French. Up until Wilson, who said, you know, human beings may have to adopt that mentality or that way of life or that pattern of life that insects ensure their own survival. And that is living in common. Knowing that everyone has a contribution to make, a participation to say, to, 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 to do and responsibility to partake. So, I think we are moving toward that point of convergence. Who was it who said, East is East, West is West? The twain shall not meet. No, I think we are learning from each other. I think we are accommodating each other. I think East is learning from West, West is learning from East. I think all of us are converging, are 
beginning to understand that the most critical challenge to the world today is not just any country's supremacy. It's not just any victory in any conflict. It not, it's not just who is richer, who is poorer. But we have to think about how to survive together with this eminent, in your constitution, those who came from Harvard, those who came from America, in your constitution, the phrase is clear and present danger. Clear and present danger. We have to be prepared for that. So I'm sure behind this idea of Harvard College in Asia program, equality, tolerance, and freedom, and the effect of policies and culture on a globalized world. Because 193 countries are the political frameworks for peoples of different cultures and different civilizations, different norms living together under one political unit. 193 of them. Those who belong to the UN, there are others who are not in the UN. But we need to evolve common policy and common platform. And we have to do it through the diversity of cultures that we have. So, at the millennium, in, in, in 2005 and 2000, they talk about millennium development goals. Remember that? Now, post-2015, they are talking about sustainable development goals. The assumption behind these 17 goals, go back and look at it, are that everyone has to participate in. We need to talk about equality, equity in the world. And we, we need to open up space for every, every gender, every groups, every tribes to think about the survival of the species together. So, you have an opportunity to come here. Others will go to Mumbai, others will go to Dubai, others will go to, others will go to Hong Kong, Turkey, Istanbul, wherever. The wisdom of it is, you will go and expose yourself to the problems, to the ways in which they prepare themselves to face that world of uncertainty. And you come back to Harvard. And you share. And you discuss. And in between, in that process, you will learn that all human beings are hoping and aspiring for the same thing. Safety, security, freedom. And the quality of life that they think they deserve, that they think their children now, I hope that in the process, you also will learn into a wise man, a Rushi Rusi. Rusi, we hear. And he said, What are you guys doing? And the soldier said, We have been commanded to kill all the legged animals and come back with the, with the skins and pave the road for the army of Alexander the Great. And the old man said, Wait a minute, think about it, be mindful. He said, If you just kill a few, not all, and make shoes for the horses and make shoes for the soldiers you might not have to kill all the big animals in the forest. The Western conception of science, or of the power of science, is that we can control the force of nature in order to respond to our needs and 
our desires. Harvest the power of nature. Exploit the power of nature so that we can use to satisfy our needs. But the wise men, the old men, represent Eastern way of looking at things. Do things in moderation. Do just what you have to. Don't kill all of them. You don't need to. It serves the same purpose. Make shoes for horses and for soldiers from few animals. So when you talk about sustainability, now, at the global level, here in this society, we came up with, well, the king, His Majesty the King, came up with sufficiency economy philosophy. And that is live within your means. Live with your mindfulness. Don't get into too much debt. Don't consume beyond your means and build your own impurity, not impurity, build your own immunity against whatever calamities that could occur. This sufficiency economy philosophy came just before the financial crisis here in Asia. And you know where the origin of that financial crisis was? Bangkok. 2nd of July, 1997. Our value of our currency from 25 baht to the dollar went up to 54 baht to the dollar. It triggered off the first financial crisis that East Asia has ever known. Because people overconsumed, people went into debt, people did not live within their means, people commit themselves more than what they can pay for. So the king came up with sufficiency economy. Sufficiency economy lifestyle or philosophy is what that old man and Rushi told the soldiers of Alexander. Do what you need to do. No more than what you need so that you can sustain the environment for yourself, for the people who live here, and for the future generation. So, cultures learn from each other. The good news is, in the West now, there is higher consciousness about conservation and sustainability. Because you have gone through that consumption mode and pattern for a long time and you realize that it's not going to be sustainable. When America consumes energy more than others, when America eats more than others, when America use, exploit more resources than others for capital, America became more aware of the fact that this pattern has to be changed. Before you were born, when America faced the first energy crisis back in 1976-77, when President Carter was in the White House, he said we need to change our way of life. He said every American people will have to come into this crusade. And he said this challenge in front of us will be the moral equivalent of war. Meaning America will have to be on war footing to face this energy crisis. So there is more awareness and consciousness in Sweden, in Switzerland, in Denmark, in the, Nord in the Nordic countries, in um, Western Europe, in America. In, in Japan. More than us here in the we are just catching up. You learn from us, we learn from you. The technology has been developed, we are trying to adopt it. But it's 
extremely expensive. <laughs> Green technology is expensive. Solar technology is expensive. But slowly we are learning to accommodate the fact that the world will not be able to sustain the way 7.3 billion people are living, are leading their lives. So we need to accommodate each other. So, Mr. Huntington said there is a clash of civilization. There are others who say no, there is an accommodation of civilization. I tend to be somewhere in the middle. I think while we are clashing, we are also learning the good things from each cultural groups, from each civilization groups, and we will have to perfect this process of adaptation, adaptation, accommodation into the future. So you are here on that mission of learning, on that mission of trying to understand the diversity of cultures on this planet. Knowing that we can't impose change on anyone, we can only accommodate and appreciate the diversity and adopt what we think is best for our own situation and hopefully for our own species. So let me say this. What John Duncan said in 17th century, and I'm sure 17, 18 Harvard students are aware of John Duncan. I hope so. He said in a poem, No Man is an Island. What he said then is even more factual, even more important, even more relevant now. You know what he said? No man is an island. When he said no man, he meant woman too. Because at that time, man means man and woman. He said, no man is an island entire of itself. And then, blah, 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 blah. But the punchline is this. Any man's death, which means any woman's suffering, which means any child's hunger, which means any children's sickness, any man's death diminishes me. Diminishes me. Because, he said, I am involved in mankind. I belong to this species. And the next line, the next stanza. So send to ask Don't send to ask for whom the bell tolls. This bell that is ringing, waking up humanity, that we have to survive together. Don't send to ask for whom the bell tolls. This rakam dang ngang dang kun kun Send not to ask for whom the bell tolls. He said, it tolls. For thee, and thee, and thee, and thee, for every one of us. That this message of collective survivability, of what we need to do in order to avoid that definite extinction if we are not careful, this message is being delivered for all of us. And I hope if you go back and realize that there's no man in an island, there's no woman in an island, there's no country in an island, then you will have learned something that we need to learn from each other in order to live together peacefully, accommodating each other, sharing what we have, not in abundance anymore, not 
infinite anymore. Air, water is no longer infinite. Everything is finite. If you get that message from your travels, from your visit to Bangkok, you will have learned something that you need for you to prepare for the future and your posterity. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you for so thank you for such an intriguing keynote. We would now like to open the floor for questions. Please raise up your hand, and our team will provide you with a microphone.
Uh, you break new world, well, you, you have to have certain controls, certain commands, certain direction. But I think each and every one of us is becoming more aware and more mature as a human being. And let us hope that through this exchange, through this efforts, we will evolve to a point where we respect each other more, we understand each other more, we appreciate each other more. We are not going to try to impose on others and we are not going to take advantage of each other. We have a long way to go in, yes. But unless you have that objective and that goal in mind, if you don't begin, you are not going to make any progress. Change must take place now. What Gandhi said, be part of it. Drive it, try to achieve it. You don't know where it's going to end, but at least you are traveling on the same road, on the same journey. And I hope you will go back to that. Individual effort, separate, different, individual, but driving at the same thing, and that is our own species. Survival and quality. There are other ways of pursuing the same thing that you are trying to do. Yeah. Yes. Um, again, thank you so much for coming. I thought it was a fascinating speech and uh, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you perhaps a, I guess it's a two-part question. So I would be interested to hear what you think the role of the nation is. So as we're going forward and talking about like the idea that like no nation is its own island and then we're all interconnected, how do you feel about like the role like, of like nations as they are established now? And then I guess more specifically, I'd, I'd be very interested to hear what you think the role of Southeast Asia is going to be mm. in the next. Two big questions. Yes, well, well two very large questions. <laughs> if you have answers, I'd be very okay. interested to The nation state that must be here with us for some time. It's a framework, as I said, that we, as a people, individual group, 193 of us in the UN, but there are others who are not, you know, members of the UN, but nation states will still be here. But many things that were the assumptions of the nation states, that were the assumptions for the relations of the, of the nation states, are now changing. At the Congress of Westphalia, when the idea of nation-state was confirmed, what, what, 1600 something, this concept of state sovereignty, that is, I am independent from you, you are independent from me, we are not going to interfere into each other's affairs. Sovereignty. That sovereignty, principle of sovereignty, served the UN. That principle of non-interference served the international community. It has served us for a long, long time. It's the foundation of international relations. But now, because the world is getting smaller, now because pandemic disease in any part of the world, in Asia we go to Africa, in Africa we go to Europe, in Europe we cross the Atlantic to America, that concept of absolute sovereignty is now being diminished. In other words, sovereignty means full responsibility of what is going on inside too. If you don't protect your people, you don't have the capacity to protect them, or you are partner to genocide, war crimes, you can't claim sovereignty to keep others out. So there's a new concept in the international relations. To get around this concept of sovereignty, absolute corporate sovereignty, and it began when there was civil war in Rwanda, when the two tribes were killing each other, when three million people perished in Kosovo, when the Croats and the Serbians and the Bosnians were killing each other. And Kofi Annan asked the world, asked the UN, what do you expect me to do when all of you claim sovereignty, state, sovereignty, sovereignty? What do you expect? Give me another instrument. So the instrument 
that the world got their heads together and came up with a principle called responsibility to protect. Meaning it's your responsibility, my responsibility, international community responsibility to protect people under threat, under danger, under genocide, under war crime. Of course, who is going to decide when? There's a responsibility to protect. Well, you have to go back to the system that we have. So you have to go back to the Security Council of the UN and you have to convince them that this is a case. That if you don't do anything, millions will perish in this conflict. Because the government could help them and because the government is party to the conflict itself. Responsibility to protect. So, nation state will be here, but there will be embellishment to the concept of nation state, to the concept of sovereignty. Southeast Asia, now is ASEAN, 600 million plus people, 10 economies, 2.7 trillion US dollars trade, but with a combined GDP of about 2.5. Smaller GDP than the volume of trade that we do. And we have been growing rather steady as tech, integrated into a community. A lot of interest from around the world because middle class is expanding. You see Bangkok. This is under economic slowdown. You go to Singapore, you'll see the same thing. You go to Saigon, you go to Ho Chi Minh City, you'll see the same thing. You go to Kuala Lumpur, you'll see the same You go to Manila, you'll see the same Vibrant, dynamic, and productive. The world is setting its sight on this landscape. And we are hoping that we will be able to satisfy the interests the relocation of factories, the investment coming in, 140 billion US dollars coming into our landscape a year. A lot of it from the US, but the majority is now among the ASEAN countries. Singapore into Malaysia, Malaysia into Thailand, Thailand goes into Laos, into Cambodia. So we are evolving into that community. Japan is connected with us, China is connected with us, Korea. India, Australia, New Zealand, ASEAN 10 plus 6 important economies around us. And I think the Asia Pacific is also evolving. So being part of that evolutionary process of East Asia, this is the bright spot on, on the surface of the Earth. And it's being expected to be locomotive of global economy. And we're doing everything we can in order to make sure that the world will not be disappointed. Are we going to be like the EU? I anticipate your questions. No. The EU is our inspiration. It is not our model. Because we began our point of origin is not different. The EU began with bigger countries, smaller countries come together and they are pretty much equal in every dimension of the word equality. There are some problems, yes, Greece. There are some problems, yes, in Eastern Europe that they have taken in later. But on the whole, open, democratic, free market, and pretty much manage their economies in the same, in the same way. We in East Asia, we in Southeast Asia, do not have that commonality. So it's going to take us some time. The next answer to you without you asking is there's no plan for one currency. <laughs> because the Eurozone have not given us a good confidence <laughs> that they could manage it well. Okay? Thank you.
How do we go about developing cultural awareness regarding the world when many nations fail to propagate coexistence within their own culture? Especially today, we can see how prominent civil wars are around the world. Good question. My answer is, what if we don't do anything? <laughs> It'll get worse. So education is extremely important and critical. That is, you expose your children about the varieties and diversity of the world. That, in the philosophical phrase, you must have a philosophical humility. And that is, you are not the only one who is right. You are not the only one who knows everything. You must be prepared for different ideas, different ways of life, different norms, different faiths, different cosmologies. Yes, we are proud of our culture, but be mindful. Others are proud of their cultures too. So, why don't we meet halfway? You have the right to be proud of your culture, but you should, you, should, you should respect mine too. I have the right to be proud of my culture, but I need to respect yours too. So, that's why it is extremely important to open up the minds of the children. That's why it is so important to have liberal arts education. I'm driving at that, you are, you are nodding. Because, because liberal arts, four years, it's the invention of America. Uh, liberal arts for four years give you the taste of all the disciplines, all the curiosities, all the diversity of the disciplines and of the cultures and of the history of everything. By the time you get through, hopefully, what you take away from four years of liberal arts education is, I have a lot more to learn. That is, my way is not the only way. That's only a song. That's, that's only what, uh, what's his name? Frank Sinatra, thank you very much. That's only, that's only Frank Sinatra. And it is important, he's also American. He's also human. As I told Kierkegaard, the philosopher of, uh, of Denmark said, every human being is an exception. We are not the same. No two of us are the same. We are different. Not even the twins are the same. In everything, we are individual in our own self. So, by the time you finish the exposure to all these rich history of human intellectual history. You will come to the conclusion that I have a lot more to learn and I have a lot more to respect and I have a lot more that I don't know. You will get to that philosophical humility. You know what Socrates said? I know that I know nothing. That's philosophical humility. Is more environmentally sustainable, less economically efficient, and more um, extended and more expensive technologies um, for the greater, greater global good is specifically that this is the reason why so many nations in the global north are in the position that they are now because they've achieved this through um, exploitative and unsustainable production practices. So, what what would be your response to this claim, and what incentive, incentives do you? Nations in the global north should offer those in the south um, that, they, they can do that, that they can develop in these ways, even if it may be at their own economic expense. And ultimately, how can we deal with the global structure of inequality and sustainability at the same time? You should have asked Dr. Passo that question. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, you are right. Yes, you are right. But I was talking about you are more conscious in the West you are more aware of the critical role of conservation, of taking care of your environment, uh, of, of paying attention.
contribution to the sustainability of your people. You have learned the lesson. And now, in the international dialogue, you are asking China to be aware of that. So, scale down your industrialization. Emit less of the smoke, emit less of the carbon. You ask India to do the same thing. You ask Brazil to do the same thing. These are the three countries who stood up and said, no, no, no. You had your chance. You are not going to stop us. Let us taste the fruit of development too. Well, I think, I think that confrontation, that face-off, has produced certain responses, positive responses from the world, from the global community. Ergo, therefore, carbon credit. And that is, if you build a factory and you use solar energy and you can prove how much carbon you can reduce by not using the traditional energy, source of energy, here is the carbon credit. It's rather complex formula how they how they create, how they calculate. But at least it has it has come to that. That is, in the past it would have been you stop. We will impose it upon you. We are not going to buy your products, we are not going to allow our technology to go to you because you are not trying to do what you can to conserve the environment of the world. But now they are saying Yes, you need to develop. Yes, you need energy. Yes, you need electricity. But make sure the source of your energy is not going to impact and affect the effect of culture and politics. It's not going to impact and negatively affect the health of the earth like we used to do. And for that we'll pay for it. For that we will help. So green technology is being developed, being transferred, Carbon credit is being set up and a lot of exchange is going on. How? To meet somewhere in the middle. That is, yes, you have your right to go on with your industrialization, but also think about when your environment is totally damaged. We have tried, we have suffered. The water of the Thames the River used to be extremely dirty. We invest into purifying it, into cleaning it, and now fish can swim in the River Thames. Make sure you don't have to do the same thing. Make sure you prevent it, your streams, your rivers, before they go rotten. We have learned the lesson. You can learn that lesson from us. You don't have to commit the mistake. The same mistake. Okay, so I think these are the things that they talk about at the at the global level in Paris last December. That you know, you, if you want us to slow down, you need to think about our right for the moment. You need to think about the need for of our people to also enjoy the prosperity that you have enjoyed and are enjoying. So the developed countries are saying, okay, we will help you. And through that exchange, there is education, through that exchange, there is that uh, adaptation and accommodation. Any of you from Harvard who come from the US, proper, or most of you? Okay. One of the policy initiatives of Mr. You are from your Secretary of State now is this global awareness, this environmental awareness, this uh, sustainability. Uh, and it's being driven through your diplomacy. Gender equality is one, sustainability is one. And these are the things that I think is appreciated around the world. That uh, you are not imposing, but you are trying to exchange and try to uh, uh, try to transfer the experiences. That don't wait until it is too late. All of us will suffer. 
if I understand right now you can you can sail from Norway to Canada through the North Pole because the ice just melt. Now there's a waterway, never before. And what does that do? The water level of the ocean will rise. And what will that do? Mountains. The mountains could disappear. So, and Bangkok, a lot of, a lot of areas in Bangkok is lower than sea level. What will happen? 80% of the population of ASEAN lives less than 50 kilometers from the coastline. We all will be in trouble. So, I think this kind, I call it substantive diplomacy. I call it diplomacy of substance, not ideology, not national interest, but the interest of the global community as a whole. European Union is doing it, Norway is doing it, Sweden is doing it, Japan is doing it. This is what I meant by global consciousness and global awareness. Because there is substance in the diplomacy, not just exploitation. Okay, so um, unfortunately not everyone is connected by IT technology, uh, so not everyone is part of this. Can you speak clearly? Not, hello? Yeah, better. Oh, sorry. Okay. Unfortunately? Yeah, unfortunately not everyone is connected by IT technology, so not everyone is part of you know, this, this village. Um, with the belief that everyone plays an important role in mitigating these clear and present danger issues, like for example access to fresh water, um, what role can the marginalized or not connected communities play in this effort? And how important is the role, considering these are typically communities most affected by yes, yes. these issues? Yes. Marginalize the communities, the people who live at the periphery of this globalization process. Good question. Well, I mean, if you ignore them, you will have to pay the costs. That's two governments and authorities will have to be aware of that not just the urban people, not just people who are already connected, not just people who are already you know, using these gadgets and technologies, but those who are outside of this network will also have to be part of this uh, journey into the future together. So that's why I think Dr. Pasuk was talking about equity on Tuesday. Yeah? Because you need to equalize opportunities, you need to equalize wealth, you need to equalize jobs, you need to equalize education. Now, some marginal communities are reluctant to come in and join. Because they have their way of life. You talk to the Ainu in Japan, you talk to the I hope I'm not talk to some of the Indian tribes. They want their own life to be the way it has been for the last thousand years. They have the right to be. But make sure that they have choices too. Make sure that there is consequence for not joining this process. But if you are living, if you are capable of Managing the consequence, that is, you will be left behind, fine. But don't be troublesome to others. In the end, opportunities will be less, but don't complain that the world left you behind. This, I think, will have to be brought into the equation. Again, individual decision, but there will be collective impact and consequences. Enlightened governments and leaders will have to deliver and consider that message that we do everything we can to be inclusive, 
to include everyone. But if they refuse, make sure they know there will be consequences and the mainstream majority will also be prepared for the consequences because things will move on. History is not going to wait. We need to manage again the conflicts and the future, possible conflict in the future, in, uh, into the future. But I would say every development strategist anywhere in the world now is claiming inclusivity is the best policy for everybody has to be part of this journey. Everybody has to benefit from the fruits of this journey. If you chose not to, you bear the consequences. We at least have made the responsibility of informing you that you have the right to be part of it. If you don't want to, you are responsible for the consequences. We will have to make sure that we will be able to protect ourselves, defend ourselves. There are a lot of cultures out there who are saying that you are not fair to us and we are going to attack you and we are going to fight you and we are going to whatever you hear daily that's lack of opportunities inequity and lack of understanding and maybe the political structures that they structures plural, many places are not effective and inclusive enough to bring them in and to give them the confidence that coming in, you are not going to lose your identity and your cultures. You will remain yourself, but you will benefit from what the main journey is going to give you. It is not beyond our capability if we have our heart put into it. And I think people on the whole can appreciate the sincerity can appreciate the rationality, can appreciate the reason and the argument. It will take effort, it will take time, it will take a lot of collective efforts. But at least we have to try because we are talking about the survival of the entire It's a big mission. But what mission is more important than the survival of the species? You can do it. We can do it. Thank you. If there are no further questions, we would like now to come to the end of the session. It is an honor to have Dr. Surin here with us, and we would now like to invite the Harvard student representatives to present a thank you gift to our speaker.
เดียร์อิสเอ็กซ์เลนซีดอกเตอร์สวิตพิศวันอาจารย์นัสนาพันวิรวันฮาวาคลีกส์เลดิสเซนจ์เมนท์ไม่เนมิสพิรพงศ์ยูหุนเดอะพรีสิเดนต์ของฮาวาคลีกส์ยูเนเชียพรแกรมอินชิลาลังกอร์ยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้บังคับ I am honored to speak on behalf of Edge Capital of God, organizing committee, who have prepared and made a wonderful march conference in Bangkok. Edge Capital of God is a program run by Chilal and God students, and in collaboration with Edge Cap in Harvard College. Our mission is to serve as a platform for establishing long-term relationship among Edge Cap partner schools, namely Harvard, Dubai, Hong Kong. Istanbul, Mumbai, Seoul, Singapore, Tokyo, and Chilean g o r University. We believe that in today's interconnected world, having an understanding and appreciation of other cultures is essential to our leadership endeavor. a s h k a b a n k o k Conference aims to meet the need of education on equality, turbulence, and freedom among Thai students, especially Chilean g o r University students. And Harvard students. Secondly, to make an impact and create a value of global citizen for Chilean and God students and Thai society as a whole. Thirdly, to gain friendship and connections between Chilean and God and Harvard delegates, which we believe that these two people are future leaders of Asia and the United States. a s h k a b a n k o k Conference ran from 13 to 18 March 2016. The conference participants mainly include 12 Harvard students, 16 e s h k a p j i l a n g a r members, 12 Lisa officer students, a number of j i l a n g a r students, teachers, officers, and the public in general. Over the past, over the previous week, e s h k a p b a n k o k organizing committees have succeeded all of our desired objectives, and on this occasion, I would like to invite a t a n r a t n a k o n Mirawan. The assistant to the president of FIST to the university to deliver a closing remark. Please welcome. His Excellency Dr. s u r i n p i s w a n distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to welcome everyone participating in Harvard College in Asia Program 2016 Bangkok Conference. It has been a pleasure meeting everyone. j o l o n g o n University is honored to have been selected as a partner school for the past three years. We endeavor to raise our standards and satisfaction portion during the conference. In the past week. We've been honored to have distinguished speakers speak on various global issues related to the theme equality, tolerance, and freedom, the effect of culture and policy in a globalized world. We have had fruitful discussion about cyber security and privacy rights with Assistant Professor p i r o n g r a m r a m a s u l k u n s a r i n i a s h a w a n a n t a k u l and Associate Professor k a n a t i p t o m r a w i w o n g On Tuesday, Professor Dr. Pa s u k p o n g p a i j i t gave a lecture on inequality, economic growth, and democracy in Thailand. We also had a thought-provoking discussion to raise awareness and to understand more about transgenders and LGBT rights with Kun t i t i y a n a n n a n p o r in p a t i y a We are honored to have His Excellency Dr. s u r i n p i s w a n with us today. To give a keynote speech on the significance of cultural understandings in a globalized world. In addition to a better understanding of various social issues addressed in each academic session, h c a p members are exposed to invaluable perspective exchange across social, political, and economic spectra. To the Harvard students, it has been a pleasure having you here with us. To share valuable ideas and engage in learning about Thai social differences and culture, it has been an educational and inspiring week for all of the EdgeCap members and conference participants. I would like to congratulate and give a big hand of appreciation to 16 EdgeCap j u l a members who organized this event. Thank you to EdgeCap j u l a
Thank you to Ed Capjula, President, Academic Finance and Relations Committee. This conference could not have happened without them. I hope that this year's conference will leave an unforgettable impression on all the participants and will enhance an everlasting friendship between the future leaders of the United States and Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ajahn Rasanapon. On this occasion, I would like to invite the president of Edgecap Jula to present a thank you gift to Ajahn Rasanapon. Thank you so much. After this, we will have a short video presentation about um, our activities that we have been doing during the past few weeks. So please be patient and watch this beautiful video with us. Thank you.